Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War, which hosts Bang and Dang. Fresh off two big battles the last two weeks that we fought, but guess what? No big battles today as we don't have anything from those two armies. But we are in still in Virginia as we have a couple battles from the Bermuda 100 campaign, which was coincided with the uh, Overland campaign, as well as two battles from what is called the uh, Crook Averill Raid on the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad. So the only two battles in that as well. So which of uh, the Union goals to obviously sabotage the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad in those ones? Yeah, maybe got uh, four. I mean, last one's a pretty decent one, but the first three are, uh, you know, you know how we roll, but we do every single one of them. We got the Battle of Swift Creeks, Cloydus Mountain, Chester Station, Cove Mountain. We got a couple mountains, some stations, and a creek. All right. All right. Before that, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Get full episodes of all the shows we do, as well as shorts, clips, and our YouTube exclusive Dart League. If you're just listening on the old Spotify and Apple, leave a review, share it with your friends, and answer that Spotify question. Starting out, first battle of Swift Creek. These are all going on at the same time that the battle of the wilderness is actually fought as well. And I believe Swift Creek and Cloyd's Mountain go on on the same exact day, which is May 9th, 1864. This is the second battle of the Bermuda 100 campaign between the armies of Major General Benjamin Butler and the old rebel himself, PGT Beauregard. May 9th, Major General Benjamin Butler made a thrust towards Petersburg and was met by Bushrod Johnson's division at Swift Creek. Premature Confederate attack at Arrowfield Church was driven back with heavy losses, but Union forces did not follow up. Of course. After the skirmish, Butler seemed content to tear up the railroad tracks and did not press the defenders. In conjunction with the advance to Swift Creek, five federal gunboats steamed up the Appomattox River to bombard Fort Clifton, while Edward W. Hinks, U.S. Colored Troops Infantry, struggled through marshy ground from the land side. The gunboats were quickly driven off, and the infantry attack was abandoned. And that is your Battle of Swift Creek. Uh, Swift. And it was in a... Well, gunboats in a creek. All right. All right. Fantastic, right? <laughs> Moving on, Battle of Cloyd's Mountain. Oh, Cloyd, him and his mountain. Right. Uh, May 9th, 1864, Pulaski County, Virginia. Part of the Crook Averill raid on the Virginia and Tennessee O Railroad. Brigadier General George Crook, I'm not a crook, um, commanded the Union Army of West Virginia, made up of three brigades from Division of the Kanawha. Uh, when old Ulysses S. Grant launched his spring offensive of 1864, Two Union armies marched towards Richmond, and the third moved into the Shenandoah Valley. Yep, Crook's troops were also involved in the offensive and began to march through the Appalachian Mountains into southwest Virginia. His objective was to destroy the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, working in conjunction with William W. Averill's offensive, which uh, will have his part in it at the Battle of Cove Mountain coming up, which uh, had similar objectives, clearly. Brigadier General Albert G. Jenkins was in command of the few scattered Confederate units protecting the rail lines. He had assumed command only the day before Crook's army began to approach the railroad. Oh. He's like, already? All right. Nevertheless, Jenkins was an experienced soldier. During 1863 Gettysburg campaign, Jenkins' brigade had formed a cavalry screen for Richard Ewell's Second Corps. Jenkins led his men through the Cumberland Valley into Pennsylvania and seized Chambersburg, burning down nearby railroad structures and also bridges. He accompanied Ewell's column to Carlisle briefly skirmishing with Union militia at the Battle of Sporting Hill near Harrisburg. During the Battle of Gettysburg, Jenkins was wounded on July 2nd and missed the final day's fight, and good for him. Right. <laughs> he did not recover to rejoin his command until autumn. Jenkins spent the early part of 1864 raising and organizing a large cavalry force for service in Western Virginia. By May, he had appointed commander of the Department of Western Virginia with his headquarters. He had been appointed the commander of the Department of Western Virginia with his headquarters at Dublin. Oh. Jenkins, having decided to make a stand at Cloyd's Mountain, set up a strong defensive position. When Crook arrived, he decided against a frontal assault 
concluding that the Confederate works were too strong and such an attack would decimate his army. Oh. The surrounding area was heavily forested, and Crook used this as cover to swing his brigades around to the Confederate right flank. Uh oh. Hey. Crook. It's the right. Union getting their right flank swung around on. Right. Crook began the battle with an artillery barrage, then sent his brigade of Green West Virginians under Colonel Carr B. White. Crook's remaining two brigades under Colonel Horatio G. Sickle and future president Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes were to launch a frontal assault as soon as the West Virginians had got underway. Serving as a major under Hayes was another future president, Willie McKinley. Look at that. White's brigade, in its first fight, advanced within 20 yards before heavy, heavy casualties from its exposed position forced it back. Crook, moving with Hayes' Ohio brigade, had to dismount and walk the slopes on foot because they were too steep. Aww. Oh. Still wearing his jack boots, he sank into a small stream the troops were crossing and his boots filled with water. Nearby soldiers rushed back and pulled him out. <laughs> He's like, I'm stuck. He's like, damn it. <laughs> Poor guy. Uh, yeah, he would have been a sitting duck there if they would have got a hold of him. Uh, Hayes' brigade spearheaded the main assault around 11 a.m. Troops fought their way to the Confederate works and severe hand-to-hand -hand fighting ensued. Sparks from the musket fire ignited the thick blanket of leaves on the ground, and many men from Sickles and Hayes' brigades were pinned down and burned oh, alive. Shit. The brigades had begun to fall back when Crook sent two fresh regiments into Hayes' front. The West Virginians finally advanced against the artillery and overran its crew. The Ohio troops now began to overwhelm the Confederate center as well. Oh, shit. Jenkins tried desperately to shift troops to threatened areas, but he fell severely wounded and was captured. Damn. His second-in-command, John McCloslin, took command and conducted a rear-guard action as he withdrew his troops. The Battle of Cloyd's Mountain was fought on the back on the Back Creek Farm. Right. The farmhouse served as a hospital and as headquarters for Union General George Crook. Okay. Battle of Cloyd's Mountain was short and involved few troops, but it contained some of the most severe and savage fighting of the war. The engagement, right, the engagement lasted a little over an hour, with much of that being hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mm. Casualties were high for the modest number of troops involved. Crook lost 688 men, which is roughly 10% of his force. Damn. Confederates lost fewer, 538, but that totaled 23% of their force. We always know they have less. All right. Jenkins died a few days after his arm was amputated. Oh, gang Poor green. guy. Well, the batter is considered a Union victory because Crook drove the old Rebs away from the battlefield and was also uh, to continue on and destroy the Virginia-Tennessee Railroad Depot at the Dublin, Virginia. Nice. Averill was also able to destroy several railroad bridges along the same line severing one of the Confederacy's last vital lifeless lifelines and its only rail connection to East Tennessee. Oh, Ooh. shit. Man. A little more important than uh, thought, huh? Lost the Mississippi and now lost her major rail line. Right. Mm. Day after the battle, the remaining Confederates unsuccessfully defended the large railroad bridge over the nearby New River. During an artillery bombardment, a soldier from the 5th West Virginia Cavalry who refused to take cover until Colonel Hayes did so was mortally wounded by an exploding shell. While gone, undergoing first aid, the soldier was found to be a woman. Oh, shit. T'was a woman. Man, you got three future presidents right here, man. That's crazy. Wow. Well, let's move on. Battle of Chester Station. Uh, 10th of May, 1864 with that battle. Action at Chester Station was a relatively minor battle of the Bermuda 100 capping. And ended indecisively. Don't they all? Started as a Union expedition against the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad. The object was to destroy the railroad in order to cut <laughs> the line of communication. It was met by uh, reconnaissance in force of two Confederate brigades led by Major General Robert Ransom, who attacked south from Drury's Bluff near the Winfrey House. Oprah. Uh, both sides fought gallantly and fiercely, including hand-to-hand -hand combat. We got a lot of hand-to-hand -hand tonight, huh? All right. When the Federal troops reached the vicinity of Cheshire Station, they were divided into two wings. The left wing, commanded by Major O.S. Sanford of the 7th Connecticut Infantry, Connecticut Infantry, moved up the railroad towards Chester Station, where the 6th Connecticut Infantry was engaged in tearing up the track, oh. and remained there for about an hour when orders came to join the other column on the turnpike below. Here, the right wing, commanded by Colonel C.J. Dobbs of the 13th Indiana, had encountered a force of Confederates too large to overcome, and Dobbs sent back for reinforcements. He said, get your asses down here. All right. In the meantime, he formed a line of battle with his own regiment on the left, the 169th New York Infantry on the right, one section of the 1st Connecticut Battery in front, supported by a detachment of 67th Ohio Infantry, 
and awaited the onset. So bring it on. The old Rebs with infantry, cavalry, artillery advanced. And when they were within easy range, Dobbs gave the command to fire. A tremendous volley uh, from his entire line checked the old Rebs' advance, and a second threw them into confusion, compelling them to retire for the purpose of reforming their lines. They're like, oh shit, me, back up. What are they thinking? Well, at this juncture, Sanford arrived with the left wing and went into position with the 6th Connecticut Infantry on the right of the road and the 7th on the left as supports to the advance lines. Two companies of the 7th Connecticut Infantry were sent forward to support a battery, and the remainder of the regiment moved up to the top of the hill and opened fire on the Confederates' left, driving them back to the woods. Mm. One of the guns of the 4th New Jersey Battery was abandoned by the men, oh. and in an effort to capture this piece was thwarted by this regiment, Sanford's... Sanford sent Lieutenant Barker with Company K to bring in the gun, which he did in the face of a gallon fire. Ooh-wee. Right. He's getting a medal. Mm, maybe. The 7th New Hampshire Infantry came up and went into position just so the old Rebs advanced again, having been reinforced, and again, they were allowed to come within easy range when they were greeted with a murderous, murderous. fire from both artillery and infantry. This settled the contest. After a vain endeavor to rally the shattered ranks, the old Reb officers gave up the attempt and sought the cover of the old woods. General A.H. Terry, commanding the 1st Division, 10th Corps, arrived on the field after action had begun, and during the latter part of the engagement, directed the movements of the Union troops. Good for Terry. All right, well, Brigadier General Seth Barton of the Confederate States of America says, To add to these difficulties, the woods were fired early in the action, and the smoke and flames driving into our lines blinded us and deranged the precision of movements. Oh. Yeah, you probably don't want to hide in woods when it's all on fire there, buddy. Right, it's crazy. General Terry reported the Union loss as being 288 moited, wounded, and missing. Estimated that the Confederates as at least twice that number. They always do. Some 50 prisoners remain in the hands of the old Federales. The return of casualties in Barton's brigade showed a total of 249 moited, wounded, and missing, including the loss of commanding officer of one of his regiments, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph R. Cabell oh. of the 38th Virginia Infantry. Two rebel brigades faced an Ohio regiment, which was pushed back despite arrival of reinforcements from Drake's brigade. Confederate successes, while they had superior numbers, including the capture of one cannon, which was recovered, huh. were halted when Hawley's brigade arrived on the field. Uh -oh. The growing Union re the growing Union reinforcements started to outnumber them, and they were compelled to retire to Drury's Bluff. I bet. While at the same time, the Federals withdrew east to the Bermuda Hundred. Ooh, the result was a draw, with neither side having surrendered, been defeated, or gained any ground. Right. The Union forces succeeded in destroying some railroad track, and the old Rebs forces succeeded in stopping them from doing any more damage. Major General Ransom relieved Brigadier General Barton of his command, and Colonel Voorhees was brevetted uh, Brigadier General for the meritorious service. So you got up to rank of Brigadier General. Good yeah. for Boris. Fantastic, Boris. All right, leads us to the last battle of the day and the biggest battle of the, well, the longest um, information on battles of the day. Battle of Cove Mountain in Wythe County, Virginia, May 10th. Whoa. So these are just two days. And it was the final engagement in that aforementioned crook Averill raid on the Virginia Tennessee Railroad. Brigadier General George Crook was assigned the task, as we know. His force was three brigades of infantry and dismounted cavalry, plus two batteries. Totaled 6,155 men. 400 more men were added shortly thereafter. Crook sent a smaller force commanded by Brigadier General William W. Averill to attack a salt mine further west from where he was. Okay. Salt mine, huh? Right. Union Army, commanded by Major General Franz Siegel in the Shenandoah Valley, was ordered to move south to Staunton, Virginia, where it could threaten the Virginia Central Railroad, and all three commands would meet at Staunton. The Battle of Cold Mountain occurred during Averill's movements to accomplish his portion of great of, of Great's plan, <laughs> of Grant's plan. Averill's so he's still trying to do what Grant wanted him to do was switch destroy railroads right. and now this guy's got him trying to go destroy a salt mine as well. Wow, well, Everell's target salt mine was located in Saltville, Virginia. <laughs> Fitting. <laughs> right. Uh, during 1864, this salt mine produced an estimated two-thirds of the salt used by the old ribs. <whistles> That's a lot. Well, Saltville is located along the border of Washington and Smith or Smythe counties in southeastern Virginia and is served by a spur line from Virginia and Tennessee Railroad. Well, there you go. Yep. Moving east on the main line of the railroad, a lead mine was located on the south of Wytheville, Virginia, not far from the railroad line. Okay. 
Lead mine was a source for much of the lead used by the Confederacy to produce bullets for its army. I would say so. Further east from Wytheville, along the rail line, was a regional Confederate Army headquarters at the Dublin Depot, which we know uh, doesn't last very long, which was New Bern, Virginia. Near the headquarters was a large Virginia and Tennessee railroad bridge across the New River, which was one of Crook's targets. I bet it was. Oh, Avro, he departed from a camp near Charleston, West Virginia in early May, two brigades totaling 2,019 men. His brigade commanders were Brigadier General Alfred N. Duffy, Colonel James M. Shoemaker. Duffy's brigade consisted of the 2nd West Virginia Cavalry Regiment, 34th Ohio Mounted Infantry Regiment, and a detachment of the 3rd West Virginia Cavalry, commanded by Major Seymour uh, Conger. Colonel William H. Powell was the commander of the 2nd West Virginia, while Major John uh, W. Shaw commanded the 34th Ohio. A couple of new names in there. Yeah. Well, Schoonmaker's Brigade consisted of 1st West Virginia Cavalry Regiment, commanded by Colonel Henry Capahart, and the 14th Pennsylvania Cavalry Regiment, commanded by Major John M. Daly. John Daly. Hmm. This brigade was armed with carbine, carbine, carbine versions of seven-shot Spencer repeating rifles. Other Union cavalrymen were typically armed with Colts, Navy revolvers, sabers, and single-shot carbines. Uh, none of those are... Matching the repeating rifles. No, not at all. The old Rebs knew that the Union forces were on the move as early as the 2nd of May and moved Brigadier General John Hunt Morgan with two brigades to Saltville from East Tennessee. His first brigade was commanded by Colonel Henry Giltner and consisted of 4th Kentucky Cavalry, the 10th Kentucky Cavalry, and the 10th Battalion, the 10th Battalion Kentucky Mountain Rifles. The second brigade was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Robert A. Alston, consisted of the 1st and 2nd Kentucky Cavalry and the 6th and 7th Confederate States Cavalry Battalions. Cool. A few days later, Morgan used the railroad to send his cavalrymen who did not have mounts, totaling about 400, east to the Dublin Depot to assist Brigadier General Albert Jenkins against Crook. Morgan focused the remaining portion of his command on Avro. Most of Morgan's men were from Kentucky or Tennessee, but Giltner's brigade was familiar with the era because it had spent two years serving there previously. Confederate troops that were not part of Morgan's command also fought at Cove Mountain, although there is a lack of clarity for all the participants. Oh, I bet there is, huh? Mm, Right. A detachment known as Jones' Brigade arrived before Morgan. The brigade was commanded by Colonel George Crittenden and included regiments commanded by Colonel A.F. Cook, which was the 8th Virginia Cavalry, and possibly Colonel Henry Bowen was the 22nd Virginia Cavalry. 16th Virginia Cavalry, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel William L. Graham, also arrived in Withville to assist Morgan. Although some sources credit Brigadier General William E. Jones, they call him Grumble, with being at the battle, two major newspaper accounts do not mention him at all. And a report by Colonel John McClawston mentions Morgan, but not Jones. No Grumble there. So no say they are not. No Grumble. Hmm. Well, either or, Avro's men departed from near the Logan County, West Virginia Courthouse, May 5th, 1864. Oh. Moved south to Oceana and West Virginia's Wyoming County on May 6th. Crossed the state border near Abbs Valley in Virginia's Tazewell County on May 7th. Here, they skirmished with enemy scouts and captured one company from the 8th Virginia Cavalry. The next day, they moved to Jeffersonville, which was a.k.a. Tazewell Courthouse, uh, skirmishing with Confederate troops from Kentucky on the way. Oh, I bet they were. Fantastic. From Desoitas and prisoners, Avro learned that the old Rebs were aware of his Saltville objective and the size of his force. He also learned that 4,500 rebel troops led by John Hunt Morgan and William Grumble Jones were waiting for his force. But I thought Jones was not mentioned. Right. Waiting for his force at Saltville, which is about 2,000 men. Given that information, Avro decided to attack the railroad further east at Wethville, occupying Morgan and Jones so they could not intercept Crook. As Avro moved east, Morgan began to follow. Just what he wants. Right. At the junction of the Jeffersonville, Crab Orchard, and Whiteville Roads, <laughs> Avro continued moving east in the mountains towards Crab Orchard, and uh, which was a rugged road and longer route to Whiteville. Okay. If Morgan had followed Avro, the terrain could have been used to Avro's advantage, but Morgan was aware of the dangerous terrain and took the southeast direct route to Whiteville, which was through Birch Garden instead. He said, you ain't fooling me, baby. We've served here, remember? Right. Well, he arrived at Whiteville ahead of his command and ordered old rebel troops already there to move north and guard the gap passing Cove Mountain, the gap necessary for Avro to pass through to get to Whiteville. The people of Whiteville were relieved to see Morgan as they remembered the destruction of the town in 1863 and Colonel John Tolan's Whiteville raid. 
The town had an old six-pounder cannon and some powder, but no ammo. A blacksmith cut up a horseshoe and uh, other pieces of iron that could be used as a canister. Jeez. Nice. Yeah. I mean, uh, anything, right? As long as it fires out. Yeah. To get to Whiteville and the lead mine further south, Avril needed to pass southward through a small mountain gap near Crockett's Cove. When he arrived at the gap, he was already occupied by the Confederate detachment sent north from Whiteville by Morgan, and more of Morgan's men were moving there. Morgan's force was said to be about 4,000, although some historians believe that future uh, figure is an exaggeration. Okay. Schoonmaker's 14th Pennsylvania and 1st West Virginia Cavalry's opened the battle by driving back the advance guard of the Confederate force that occupied the gap. Oh, fantastic. We're going to go through here, guys. Right. When the old Union Cavalry got too close to the gap, dismounted Rebel Cavalry on both sides of the gap drove them back. 2nd West Virginia Cavalry waited nearby with sabers drawn, intending to take the gap in what their Colonel Powell regarded as a suicidal charge. Damn, kamikaze in that shit. While the regiment was waiting, a member of the regiment's Company H climbed up a tree and absorbed the Confederate position being reinforced. This was reported to Duffy, and the charge was canceled. Although not known by Avril at that very time, reinforcements, including Morgan's brigades, were positioned on both sides of the gap, and a cannon masked by brush was positioned in the road. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, man. Morgan's command had reached Whiteville around 3 p.m. and then headed north to the gap. Colonel Glitner's, Giltner's 1st Brigade and Lieutenant Colonel R.A. Alston's 2nd Brigade with Giltner in overall command were deployed in the woods of the mountain on Morgan's left side of the pass in an effort to circle around Avril's right flank. Uh-oh. Unable to penetrate the gap and aware of the Confederate reinforcements, Avril's command fell back and formed a line of battle to lure the Confederates out into the cove. A large Confederate force came out of the gap and more fighting began. Ooh-wee. I said, all right, I'm your huckleberry. Right. Giltner's two brigades attacked Avril's right while dismounted. Morgan commanded Jones' brigade in Poison in front of Avril's left center and made use of Whiteville's cannon. A third Confederate force attacked Avril's left flank. A soldier from the 1st West Virginia Cavalry, which faced Morgan's 1st and 2nd Brigades, said the old Reb's battle cry was, We are Morgan's men, and we give you hell. Avril's forehead was grazed by a bullet early in the fighting, a slight wound that bled profusely. (laughs) I bet. Uh, He was forced to temporarily relinquish command and, with Duffy nowhere to be found, Fell, uh, field command fell to Colonel Powell. Powell divided the 2nd Virginia Cavalry into platoons and gradually moved it back with the precision of what Avril called a dress parade that continued without disorder under heavy fire. Avril later credited the 2nd West Virginia Cavalry with saving the left of the division. Although the 2nd West Virginia was nearly surrounded three or four times during the four hours of fighting, the only break in the Union line was made by the 14th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Oh, all right. Hmm. Okay, the 34th Ohio Mounted Infantry quickly filled the gap from its reserve position. 14th Pennsylvania reformed and resumed their place in the Union line. Nice. Avril's force was pushed back a considerable distance and fighting ended at dusk. Avril's report lost about 114 officers and men. Estimates of Confederate losses ranged from 40 to 60. One Union soldier, who was at the battle and believed Avril's force was almost surrounded, thought that the old Rebs had more casualties than Avril's men because the old Rebels did not. They did all the charging while the Union soldiers were on defensive. Yeah, they have to have that more. makes sense, right. All right, these guys coming out right in the gap. A private in the Union Cavalry believed that if the fighting had not been stopped, half of the Union force would have been captured. Right. Morgan believed that he could have captured Avril's entire force if he had two more hours of daylight. Mm. Avril used an elaborate deception to save his command. First, he told a staff officer that if they could hold Morgan's men until dark, Crook's force would arrive to reinforce them. This was said in front of a local woman from the pro-Confederate community with the hope that the bogus information would get back to the Confederate leadership. Uh, Look at that guy. Huh? All right. Secondly, he had an officer notify him that Crook arrived. Third, he ordered his men to give three cheers for General Crook. It is unknown if the deception or darkness caused the fighting to stop, but Morgan's men returned to the gap. Avro had his men build one fire for every two men. Damn, that's a lot of fires. About 1,000 fires were made to make it appear that Crook had arrived. Under the cover of darkness, Avril's force withdrew. The severely wounded were left behind at the Crockett's Cove Presbyterian Church. Oh, you gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Right. Avril's men had to ascend and descend a mountain that did not have any uh, good roads, so they Dang. led their horses while on foot. That sucks. By dawn, the command was at the bottom of the mountain with 30 miles of difficult terrain between them and the cove. Mm. Here, they rested for a half a day before continuing to the Dublin Rail Depot. Uh-oh. Even on May 11th, the Union horsemen reached the depot and spent the night there in soaking rain. Oh, that sucks. Wow. Well, there they discovered that Crook had already destroyed the large railroad bridge over the New River. 
and the river itself was rising rapidly because of recent rain. The river grew to about one-third of a mile wide and rising with a rapid current and rocky riverbed. Avril's men forded the new river about three miles west of the Christianburg, and several men and horses drowned. Oh, poor guys. After the command arrived at Christiansburg, 2nd West Virginia Cavalry was sent back to guard the ford and witnessed the Confederate forces unable to cross the still-rising river. Mm. Nice. At Christiansburg, the command found a small Confederate force that they drove away with drawn sabers. Oh. They also captured a two, uh, two three-inch caliber artillery pieces as well. Good for you guys. Right. Right. From Christian Boyg, Avro was able to communicate with Crook and was ordered to destroy rail line eastward. The rail depot and four miles of line were destroyed. And then a trip back to the safety of West Virginia was started. Some of the ammo was rendered useless from the river and rain. And Avro's after-action report mentioned that his ammo was nearly exhausted as the reason for his departure. Mm, that's a good reason. Got, got no ammo. Well, admitted do do? from his report, though, was that uh, by a ruse on uh, Telegraph, he had learned that Confederate troops were coming from the east by rail, and he thought it was in his best interest to join Crook's column that was already in Blacksburg, Virginia, then continue north to the safety of military bases in West Virginia. Oh. Avro was pursued by three Confederate forces commanded by Brigadier General John M. Bowden, Colonel William E. Mudwall Jackson, Mudwall, and Colonel William H. French. All right. No oh, Mudwall, huh? The old Reb forces were unable to catch Avro at Blacksburg, and Crook had also left already. And uh, so the pursuit was continued further north. On the morning of 13th of May, 1864, Jackson tried to intercept Avro at Salt Pond Mountain and Gap Mountain. Rain made the terrain slippery and mountain streams became dangerous. And Bodden's report said that the Gap Mountain, Jackson intercepted Avro's command and scattered it in the mountains. Owing to the darkness in the swollen streams, no further pursuit was made with the infantry. Mm. A soldier from the 2nd West Virginia Cavalry wrote that they were fired upon by Confederate artillery near Gap Mountain, so two companies of skirmishers occupied the enemy while the column crossed the mountain while dismounted. Oh. Their path was narrow and dangerous, and the mountain was steep. Oh. The men used one hand to lead their horses by the bit, and the other hand to uh, held the tail of the horse in front of them. Okay. The command continued north using narrow and unfrequented pass and roads. roads. May 15th, Avro met Crook near Union, West Virginia, and oh. said, we made it, boys. Fantastic. <laughs> well, this very battle, Cove Mountain, uh, is declared indecisive by the National Park Service. Avro praised his command, saying it attacked and held a superior force the enemy near Withville on the 10th instant, thereby enabling another column to accomplish its purpose without the opposition of overwhelming numbers. New York Times wrote that the cavalry raid of that dashing and gallant officer, General Avro, was undoubtedly one of the most hazardous and brilliant of the war. It was too successful. All right. This contrasts, though, obviously, with the Confederate newspaper in Richmond, which called the battle a very important victory for the Confederacy. Right. A report by Colonel McCausland said that Avro had been defeated by Morgan near Wytheville. Hmm. Another source says Morgan caught Avro at Crockett's Cove near Wytheville and drubbed him severely. Oh. Numerous changes, what, numerous changes happened to the leaders of the battle during the remaining portion of the year. Before and after the battle, Duffy and Avro did not get along. Oh. Duffy moved to another division as a replacement for General Julius Stahel. Stahel? who was wounded on June 5th at the Battle of Piedmont, which we'll have coming up here. Well, Grant's plan to put pressure on Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was only partially successful at Foist. Crook had a major victory at the Battle of Cloyd's Mountain and completed an objective of destroying the large New River Bridge used by the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad. However, Avril was unable to damage the salt mines or lead mines, and Siegel was defeated on the 15th of May at the Battle of New Market. Crook Avril and Siegel did not meet at Staunton oh, at all. Is. Although there are various interpretations of the outcome of the Battle of Cove Mountain, one cannot dispute that the Wythe County lead mines in Austinville continued to supply ammunition for the Confederate Army. Right. As of 2001, the Cove Mountain battlefield at Crockett's Cove still had much of its integrity. Mm. And two historic houses, a cemetery, and the Crockett's Cove Presbyterian Church still there. Oh, shit. Church was listed in the National Register of Historic Places October 10, 1992. Seventeen Union soldiers died there. A Virginia historical marker is located near the Mountain Gap, and another marker is located at the other end of the cove at the church. The, God, the John Crockett House and Cemetery are located near the center of the cove. Fantastic. Right. All right. Bunch of indecisives. Well, look at that shit. Well, I got some railroads 
Pretty important railroad lines uh, destroyed, though. So right, 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 right. Good for them. I'd say. We'll have the Yellow Tavern battle next week of the Overland campaign, as well as the Battle of Proctor's Creek, which is part of the Bermuda 100 campaign. And then we'll probably also have the Battle of Rosaka, which we're moving to Georgia, which is part of the Atlantic campaign. Georgia! And that, oh, look at that. Look at that. That's probably going to be it. Three battles next week for us. Oh, yeah. Maybe. What was Proctor's Creek? Not really. Ooh, I don't know. Then we'll probably have uh, the Battle of Newmarket as well, which is these, uh, which is a Lynchburg campaign. So we got a couple of campaigns. <laughs> campaigns. This one's in Shenandoah, Virginia. So we got a couple of different places coming here, but right. big. Uh, Big summertime battles are coming up. Warm. That's where we get to fighting, boys. Yeah. So, yeah, join us next week for those four battles, at least. Remember, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. All of our shows, all that good stuff. And listen on Spotify. Apple, give us a review and answer that Spotify question. We'll be back next week for more battles of the American Civil War. We'll be out of the music. And as we Bang Dang. Do.